my name is uh, Philippos. Uh, I've been working uh, on APIs in the past two and a half years. I was previously working uh, in a startup in uh, Videofy as a lead back engineer, and now I'm working in uh, Koliagorna, uh, where we build the uh, APIs for uh, clients that want to move from desktop to mobile apps. So I'm going to talk about uh, introspected uh, REST APIs. And uh, I'm going to jump straight to, to the topic, basically. I think uh, pretty much everyone knows or has heard what REST is. Uh, but in case you haven't, uh, REST is uh, simply uh, an interface with uh, four constraints. Uh, one of them is uh, to have uh, identification of resources. Uh, another one is like clients must uh, manipulate and interact with those resources only through representations, which means like if you have something else on your database and you expose uh, a totally different representation to the client, it means the client only knows and should only know uh, this representation. Uh, of course, uh, self-descriptive messages and uh, the last thing is like uh, hypermedia is the, is the engine of application state. Uh, that, that created a huge hype about two years ago. Uh, about hypermedia links and that kind of stuff. Uh, so if we go REST by book, uh, if we have like this simple app, which is starting from Nordic API's web app, web page. Uh, so if we wanted to have a client, a mobile client, to render this space, it means like from the server we have to drive this, the, the client, we have to give all information, we have, to, we, we have to drive the client, and we have to give all information to the client about what uh, what uh, is allowed to do. For instance, if we have this form now, the client should get from the server uh, what uh, the form uh, accepts, like what attributes, uh, in what uh, uh, media it should be sent, like uh, JSON or something like that. And uh, if there are any links about like speakers, all, all those kind of stuff are uh, coming from the server response. So we could say like in a way that the server response uh, reflects the UI. Uh, I have another example here, uh, also exactly from Nordic APIs. Uh, it means like if the, if the client wants for some reason, I mean the client renders, renders the speakers, and if the client wants for, for some reason to, to go uh, to Joachim, uh, the, the server must provide the link for that. Uh, and of course we have like different clients, different devices, uh, we need, to, from the server side, we need to render the, like different content, which is like easy to parse or, I don't know, apply it for desktop uh, application. It's, it's up to, to the client to ask and negotiate for the content. Uh, but in practice, uh, if we build an API now in 2016, uh, we don't actually do that because we don't know beforehand what the client will need. And in order to facilitate the client to ask exactly for what, uh, is needed, we actually do, a, we follow a different process. Uh, we, we try to develop a very flexible API. We try to split the contents uh, in uh, resources. Uh, and we try to provide links and hypermedia at runtime. Uh, and of course, we, we give some uh, detailed documentation. And this is what we want to actually remove from this flow. Uh, so I would say we have already slided away from uh, Roy's initial model, and we shouldn't feel guilty about that. I mean, we don't have the uh, we don't have the resources to build like a true REST uh, API, and maybe it's not like exactly what we should do. Uh, so nevertheless, we have built we have we have been building really good APIs. We have uh, pro we provide to the client like sorting, pagination, uh, filtering. We provide like even aggregation queries, for instance, like give me the average followers of a user. Uh, we, ha we try to, to do our best, like only uh, uh, allow the client to select only specific fields, attributes of the response. But I would say when it comes to hypermedia, I think people are getting confused about that. I mean, what's being included? Is it only links? Should they also allow and give uh, uh, the client information about how they can manipulate the resources. So, for instance, think about we're building the next Twitter. Think like we have users and we have microposts. And each Microsoft, uh, micropost, uh, each tweet, let's say, has uh, comments, likes, and all that kind of stuff. Uh, now, I would say like the average API developer would go straight to the uh, re response and try to, to provide links to the clients. But uh, 
it's getting really confusing. I mean, what kind of links should you provide? Should you provide like all the links? For instance, like an, a client with with uh, uh, augmented uh, with uh, sorry with more uh, authorization, like an admin, could have uh, accessibility to more uh, to do more manipulations that could have uh, accessibility to more links. Should we also provide those? Uh, or should we provide only what the client uh, is authorized to do? That kind of stuff are getting really messy. Uh, so I'm going to go straight uh, uh, to, to show you some current API specs and what we're doing at the moment, uh, according to some uh, yeah, API specs. So the first one is JSON API. It was uh, proposed about uh, two years ago, something like that. Uh, it's a very good specification. It exactly specifies where you can find the data, where you can find hypermedia, where you can find uh, links, uh, ads, pagination, sorting, that kind of stuff. Uh, but I mean, if we go like, if we try to uh, uh, to evaluate this specification uh, according to hypermedia, I would say it only provides links. It doesn't provide anything about how can we update the resource or how can we create the resource. Uh, which is, uh, these are called actions, or how, I mean, what exactly the API returns? I mean, what what fields uh, the API returns, and what can I, can I select from those fields? Uh, the, sec the second one is HAL. It does provide URI templates, but still it fails to provide, uh, uh, it, it fails to provide actions. As I said, like, to be able to, to, to to update or create a resource. We don't have any information. Actually, there is a HAL uh, extension. We does provide that. But HAL by itself, it doesn't. And of course, still there are no like, information about what attributes there are on the API, or what even like what data types of those attributes. Like, is it a Boolean? Is it a string? OK, okay it's a string. But what kind of string? Is it, is it a date, or is it something else? Uh, last but not least, uh, Sarin is less popular. Uh, less popular uh, API specification. Uh, it does provide links. It does provide actions. So it can tell you, you know what? You can update this resource on this endpoint, and we need those attributes. But still, uh, it falls behind when it comes like about data types. OK, you need to provide a string, but it doesn't say about what kind of string, like the format of that string. Uh, so. I would say, like, if we want it like to be perfect in terms of hypermedia, we need to drive and tell the client beforehand or at runtime, according to REST, uh, we need to tell the, the client that you know these are the available attributes that you get back, and these have these data types. I mean, JSON has some data types, but still we need more strict data types. Uh, you can uh, man you can get uh, related resources through those links, and you can update the resource from uh, like doing uh, a post request or uh, a put request or a pass request of that link, and we need those uh, attributes. Uh, but if we, I mean, if we try to do that at runtime, I would say we have serious performance issues. We have serious performance issues because we don't know beforehand uh, what uh, the client will need, so we try to give everything to the client. And uh, at, that, at the same time, this incre increases the complexity a lot. Uh, and possibly, the client doesn't need all those information. The client could just want to get the, the data, just that doesn't need any update or anything like that. But, but exactly because we don't know beforehand what the client is, we try to give everything. And uh, I think I miss my good old API. <laughs> Uh, at 2006, I was studying. I, was, I wasn't building APIs, but I'm pretty sure, like the first JSON API about like the next Twitter in 2006, it would be like that: no hypermedia, no actions, no links, just data. And uh, to be honest, I like that, and I miss that. So, is it possible to build this today but still have hypermedia? Is it possible to have like a response which is like super easy, easy for even for the human eye to understand? Uh, and of course, for the client, it's easier to parse and still uh, give hypermedia to, to the client. Well, the, yeah, yeah the, answer, the answer is yes, we can do that. If we, if we are brave enough to take one more step, because we have already slided away from REST, but uh, if we are brave enough to do one more step and say, 
you know what? We need to separate data from hypermedia and from uh, documentation and data model. So we need to, to have like, when we send a response to the client, we need this, this response must be clean. And hypermedia, we need to provide on demand on the client using other methods. Like we can provide uh, hypermedia uh, to the client when the, the client asks it in the initial root URL, and the client can, can cast all, all hypermedia for all states. Or, or the client can do an HTTP options request and ask for hypermedia. But it's on demand. We don't have them on the response. And uh, we can use that. I'm going to show you an example with uh, JSON schemas. We use that in uh, Vidify, actually. Uh, and this whole procedure is called API introspection. Uh, so the flow is pretty much the same. We still develop a very flexible API. We still split contents. Uh, we, we do all what we did. But the only difference is like, Instead of providing hypermedia at runtime, we try to provide an automated way for the client to parse hypermedia and know exactly when it fetches a response, what hypermedia and what this response uh, supports. Uh, so in order to achieve that, we do uh, JSON schemas. It's, uh, JSON schema is not something like we, we suggest here. It's already out there. It has been tested. It's an RFC published, uh, it's for uh, uh, validating your JSON, uh, and uh, it adds kind of data types in JSON. Basically, it, it validates that it has the, this kind of structure, and uh, the string is, for instance, is an email or is it, isn't something like, uh, isn't something else. So we're going to use JSON schemas, and I'm going to show you how it's easy for the client to have uh, the data separated for, from uh, hypermedia. So if we have like if we have this simple uh, API uh, response, which it is just a user. It has an ID, it has a name, it has an email, uh, and some other attributes. So we can say uh, if if the, if the client is interested in hypermedia, the client can send an HTTP option request, or it can send like a, a request to the root URL to get all the hypermedia, and uh, we can tell the client, you know what? These are the attributes that the API supports, and these are the attributes that the API returns. So just, just in case you're interested, you can like ask any of them if you want. But uh, and also, yeah, and also we can also say, you know, not only we provide you the attributes, but we, we provide you with details about, about the data types of the attributes. I mean, we can say like uh, the name is a string, the email is a, is a string, for instance. And uh, go one step further, because JSON schemas are very powerful. We can even say, you know, the name is not just a string, but it's, it follows this specific regular expression. And uh, it has ma uh, minimum length and uh, maximum length. So that for your interest to know, you might want, I mean, the, the client might want to render something different in case, it, I mean, depending on the, on the length of the, of the name. Uh, so the same goes with uh, the simple tweet. I mean, uh, we have a credit at, which is a string. Jason says it's a string. But still, we can say to the client, you know, it's not just a string. It's, it's a date format. And it's in UTC. So you need to parse it in that way. I mean, these kind of things, to have them in runtime, it's uh, super difficult. So we, what we do, we separate uh, data from uh, hyper, uh, hypermedia uh, and documentation. So in that way, we... We specify and uh, we say to the client about available attributes and uh, the data types of the attributes. And then uh, when it comes to links, uh, JSON hyper schemas also support links. So it's super easy to say, you know, these are the related resources. Uh, super easy. And then uh, about actions like updating or deleting resources, uh, also JSON schema supports that. Hyper, JSON hyper schemas, which is an extension of uh, JSON schemas. And we can say, you know, uh, you can like send, uh, uh, in order to create a tweet, you can send a content which has like minimum and maximum length. So the client knows before sending the request, knows if either request is going to be semantically valid or not. Uh, and this is like super important because if it's not, before sending a request, the client can show an error to the user. So uh, I would say like, what it changes here is like we still have like 
hypermedia, but we have them in a, in a different way. We provide the, the, the hypermedia on demand. We provide like everything the client could need, like available attributes, data types, links, and how you can manipulate the representation. But you, you get them on demand. And you can cast them if you, if you want. We can add like cast headers, uh, all that kind of stuff I would do on REST. Uh, and this will lead, of course, to better performance. Uh, because we don't render that, this kind of information uh, at runtime, uh, it will lead to like a, an API, a documentation-driven API development, and it's super easy to test these kind of things because you have the specifications and you share those specifications with the client and with the server. So I'm going to show you some uh, some simple uh, specifications that already support that kind of uh, pattern. Uh, the first one is like Open API, or also called uh, Swagger. Uh, the idea is like uh, the Swagger is like initially created for writing uh, it for writing documentation automatically. It's uh, it's not an API specification, but uh, it's a, a specification for writing documentation. Uh, but still, it's uh, it's very powerful. Although complex, it's very powerful. It can all, all always. Uh, it, it can also uh, describe the headers, which is like super good. Uh, but uh, it's not, as I said, it's not API specification per se, so it needs some adaptation. Uh, for instance, like where to find this uh, information, it's not uh, defined the specification. Uh, the second one is, uh, is a Hydra specification. Uh, it's more research oriented. Uh, it provides links, uh, it provides attributes, it provides actions, although no data types. Uh, and it also provides a context uh, in terms of uh, social web. Uh, it provides context through schema.org. Uh, schema.org was uh, a combined effort from Google, Microsoft, Yahoo, and uh, another company, uh, I can't remember its name, to actually to be able to create uh, like uh, information, sem semantic information about uh, your API. So if you, if you say like, you know, this API returns a user, uh, but it's type of person. The machine will understand that the, what the attributes of the user could be and uh, what, uh, what it means. It's, it's a person, so it has some relations to, to, other, uh, to other schemas. Uh, and uh, the last one is uh, GraphQL. Uh, it's going to be covered in the next talk, but I would say just one minute here. It's, it, ha it doesn't have links, unfortunately. Uh, but the idea with GraphQL is like you put it on top of everything, so you can like have a wrapper of your all APIs, and it has very good, a very robust, uh, robust uh, introspection. It also have actions, so it can tell you how you can manipulate, how you can create, and what is needed to create a resource, all that kind of stuff. Uh, but I will let uh, Joachim to, to, to describe uh, GraphQL. Uh, at this point, I would like to say that the JSON schemas that uh, I, I described you was just an idea. I don't want you to, uh, to actually stack on the implementation, but uh, actually think about uh, the whole thing. Think about the pattern. Uh, so instead, instead of having like the hypermedia mixed inside with the data, and making very difficult to understand uh, where is the data, where is the hypermedia, and making also very difficult for the server developer to actually include all the hypermedia, all that kind of stuff. Uh, there is another way where we can also provide hypermedia, like on uh, on the side to the clients that really need, really need it, really want it, and we can separate the data and provide only the data, very simple and very easy to the client, easy to parse, easy to even for to debug for developers, client developers, to see what's going on. Uh, so I would say, like, don't be guilty and don't be afraid to take one more step because we have already slided away from REST. And don't be guilty to take one more step and uh, slide away one more time and uh, at the same time provide an API which is much more easy to work with and much more easy to debug and also drives uh, the client uh, uh, exactly where it's needed to from the server. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I think questions will be answered after two talks. And uh, Joachim is co is coming to talk about uh, GraphQL and uh, comparison with uh, comparison with REST APIs.